Xiaomi buys Segway. Jerry Seinfeld calls YouTube a giant garbage can. And one patient MIT inventor lets me compare his PhD thesis to Uber. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 317 for Wednesday, April 15th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price, because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash TN2 and enter promo code TN2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. This is the show where we give you the top tech headlines of the day and where we talk to the people making the headlines. We'll get to today's news after the break, but first joining us to talk about his work is inventor and researcher at MIT Media Lab, Robert R. Morris. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. My pleasure. So your work focuses on using technology and computer-based interventions for mental health. How did you get into this field? Well, I started in psychology, so I did my undergraduate in psychology, and then I did some clinical research uh, apprenticeships and assistantships, and I actually started a PhD in psychology, but I felt like there was an engineer or designer inside me just aching to come out. I wanted to build things, and none of my advisors really understood that impulse or knew how to cater to it. So I came to the MIT Media Lab, which is a really wonderful interdisciplinary department where I could take you know, what I was interested in with respect to psychology and look at ways to apply new technologies to help further mental health interventions. So did you do any programming at all before you got to MIT? No, I did not. I didn't even know what a for loop is or was or any of these basic things. I really showed up a complete novice. That's impressive. So let's talk about Panoply. Panoply is how you pronounce mm -hmm. it, I think. It's a project you describe as crowdsourcing application for mental health. What exactly is it? Well, I think one way to describe this project um, for your viewers or listeners is I kind of like to think of it as a stack overflow for the mind. So if you're familiar with Stack Overflow, it's a question and answer site for computer programmers. And it's a place where you can go online and this huge crowd and collective of programmers uh, comes together to help you identify and fix bugs in your code. Um, so what Panoply does is it actually uses a similar type of collective intelligence framework to help you identify and fix bugs in your thinking. So for me, when I was first attending MIT, as you mentioned, I had no programming experience. Um, but the biggest problem for me was not the bugs in my code necessarily, but the way in which I thought about them. So my thinking was buggy. I would see a bug in my code and I would think, uh, this proves I'm an idiot. I'll never survive here. Or I'm going to fail. Um, and what I did was I took what I learned in psychology and applied what's called cognitive therapy uh, to a framework that looks pretty similar to Stack Overflow and other social networks. It's a social way for people to get together and practice evidence-based techniques for emotional health and well-being. It's really interesting because I think what you describe is familiar to a lot of us when we start getting into technology. And a lot of us also, you know, it's learning as we go. I mean, this hasn't been around forever. This stuff is changing so often. And a lot of how you learn is just how you enter into it. How much do I know? And, you know, there's that stereotypical IT person who, you know, once you realize, like, a lot of times they're just pretending to know what, <laughs> what you know, as we just experienced when we were having technical difficulties, mm -hmm. all you have to do is turn it off and turn it back on, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's how you, you face it. So, so what you're saying is Stack Overflow really gave you the idea that another community could help someone if they were depressed or suffering some, from some other mental health issue. Yeah, that's, that's precisely it. Um, the Stack Overflow kind of metaphor just screamed at me on the screen when I was uh, laboring with my own issues of, you know, catastrophic thinking and pessimistic thinking about my own performance at MIT. Um, as you said, I foolishly started with no engineering <laughs> training whatsoever. Interested. So, so what you're talking about is different than like the teletherapy apps that we've heard about. You know, you can have an app and connect to a real therapist or, you know, there's marriage therapists that work with apps and, um, you know, therapy through Skype, but that's not what you're talking about. Yeah, this is different in, in several respects. So in one respect, you're actually not interacting with trained therapists. We don't 
necessarily presume anyone on the network uh, is a trained therapist, although I can say that a lot of people uh, who are therapists are on there now. But um, the idea is that everyone is teaching each other these basic skills, introducing each other to these skills in a very safe way. And we think there's tremendous value uh, being playing the role of a, a teacher. I, I personally find that the best way for me to learn something is if I'm teaching it to others. And on this platform, it's a nice, beautiful give and take where you can you know, post about what you're stressing out about and you'll get these beautiful insights from the crowd and they're all trained and nudged to do that appropriately. Um, but you can also step into the other role as a helper and you can practice these techniques, techniques you might ordinarily practice in a workbook or reading a book, um, but you're practicing them with other people who are really, really happy and grateful for you to take the time to help them. And it's just a very rewarding and pleasant experience. And, and we do have some interesting data coming out um, that acting as a role of helper actually helps reduce um, depression symptoms and improve well-being as well. So the idea is if you can help someone else through their negative thoughts, then you can be able to do it yourself also. Yeah, that's precisely it. It's just training a mental muscle. So would you describe it as like a, a Facebook for therapy? Um, I guess it's similar in that sense. I like to think of it as a social network that actually makes you feel better the more you use it. Um, it does bear a resemblance to Facebook. We tried to make the platform um, as engaging as possible, and certainly applications and platforms like Facebook, Twitter, really are great at bringing you back to the screen again and again. And I think one of the shortcomings with most of the therapy apps out there now that you download to your phone that have you go through similar skills is that they're just not engaging and people just don't use them enough to get the, the requisite dose that could be helpful. Right. So one of the big criticisms, of course, of Facebook or Twitter or any kind of you know, social network is that we're not connecting in real life. So you know, what do you say to that to someone who says, well, this is just more like disconnection because you're not face to face with someone? Yeah, I think the answer is that you're learning these really powerful skills that endure offline. And people are constantly going on the platform uh, with, you know, problems about maybe approaching that person to ask them out, um, speaking up in class. Um, and the idea is that when you learn these tools and when the crowd coaches you more adaptive, more healthy ways to think about them, it actually translates into better behaviors offline. So you feel more open, more willing to engage with the world. Um, so I think it's, it's a place where you can practice the techniques safely uh, without a lot of uh, need to go drive to your therapist's office or um, make a huge commitment. But the idea is that once you learn these, they'll help you um, engage in the real world more fruitfully. As I do think a lot of times people turn to a lot of the apps on our phone when, when they're not feeling very good. Um, and I think if you build the tools to uh, live a better, healthier life, that just naturally translates into engaging with the world more directly. Right. I mean, like you're saying, there's lots of barriers to therapy, not just like getting in your car, but there's the cost, you know, health plans don't cover it. Just the mm -hmm. stigma, you know, the stigma of it, you know, and where do you find one? I mean, this, this could get through all of that without the, the problem with Facebook. You don't have to, you're not going to the site to see someone's beautiful Hawaii pictures or their beautiful children or all the other things, their house that's perfectly clean all the time, their great job, all the things <laughs> that make you tend to feel yeah. bad about yourself if you're already in that mindset. So, so your app is called Coco. It's still in the invite only stage. What mm -hmm. was your experience building it? Uh, so it was really an experience of taking what I built as a research platform at MIT. So my first goal at MIT was to see if this was even feasible, whether it's safe, effective. And so I built the platform to run what's called a randomized control trial to assess clinically whether repeated use of it actually confers any psychological benefits. Um, once I found that out, uh, I had an unexpected realization that the people in the app really loved using it and they were on there very frequently. So it was a matter of taking what was a web-based research tool and translating it into a more consumer-friendly mobile app. Um, and that's where we are now. And uh, we'd love to have people come help us test it and improve it. And it's really a place where we're trying to build a community that's all working together to make this thing work as well as it can. So tell us a little bit about it. How, how, who did you have testing this for you? What did, what, what did you use? Where did you find the people to help you test it? Uh, yeah, so in the study, we uh, recruited pretty widely. We tried to have a fairly diverse sample 
Uh, we had, of course, a lot of college students. If you're familiar with any kind of psychology study, um, psychology students are almost the first people that come on board. But we also had other students. We had people from social networking. We had uh, people from Craigslist. We had flyers. We canvassed everywhere we could to get a nice mix of different users. And it wasn't for anyone specifically who was you know, self-identified as depressed or anxious. We really like to think of it as uh, bigger than that. Um, so we advertised it as a stress reduction application, and that's where we recruited people. Great. So now, is this like, do you see this as becoming like an Uber for therapy? Will, the, will therapists go the way of cab drivers? No, I think it, it is a great companion to traditional therapy. If anything, one of the beautiful things that I'd like to come out with is reducing stigma about therapy. Um, that's something you mentioned as a barrier to seeking therapy. Um, and I think once people start to understand what some of the techniques and skills are, they can feel less threatened by them and in some cases find them actually fun, interesting, enjoyable. Um, I definitely have at least some anecdotes of people expressing more willingness to go to more traditional mental health after having used the app because they experienced um, some of the benefits firsthand. And uh, I have spoken with a lot of therapists who argue that it could be a great companion app. So if you see your therapist maybe once a week, um, why not continue to practice the skills in between sessions with an app like this? Right. Well, I'm sure you get this question all the time, but um, what kind of, what do you have built in that will deal with trolls or, you know, just the other things mm -hmm. that we see on the internet where people just, you know, want to mess something up just because? <laughs> yeah. Um, so this was something that was at the forefront of this project from the very beginning. So in the initial phases, I did work with the MIT Institutional Review Board to make sure it was extremely, we set a really high bar to make sure it was safe and prevented those things from happening um, for the purposes of the study. And we've retained those procedures and even improved on them. Um, briefly, some of the things we do is have paid moderators look at content. We also have a variety of algorithms that automatically filter out content. Um, I think the simplest answer is it's something we're continually working on and is a, is a huge part of product development. It's not an afterthought. It's one of the first things we always think about when we're uh, making new changes to the app or um, adding new elements. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, I think we we reported yesterday on a Cornell study that says it's pretty easy to, to have an algorithm that could find trolls. I mean, there's pretty specific behavior, so it doesn't seem so out of the realm. So you have uh, some other projects that are worth mentioning. Um, can you tell us about Pavlov's poke? I hope it's not a joke because I need this. <laughs> um, well, it was kind of a joke, actually. Oh, but okay. um, I, I have heard there is like a, a product that is very similar um, called Pavlock, I believe. Um, so if you look that up, if you really want it, okay. you, can, you can find a, some kind of um, similar device. So what Pavlov Polk was, I was doing my dissertation and my office mate and I found that instead of actually doing real work, we would find ourselves on Facebook somewhat mysteriously. So I would go online to maybe look up something on Wikipedia or some journal article. And without even realizing it, my fingers would start typing www. Dot F, and then it would autocorrect, and I would be on Facebook. I'd be looking at pictures of puppies or whatever, and it would be minutes before I even realized why I was there, how I got there. So I found myself going to Facebook uh, without any conscious intention to do so, and that really irritated me. Um, and as MIT students like to do, we came up with the most strange solution to the problem, which was we decided to hook up a little electric shock circuit to our computer, and if I made the sin of going to Facebook too often, it would shock me. Um, and if that didn't work, our code would automatically send a job out to Mechanical Turk, which is Amazon's online um, marketplace where people can do little jobs for you. And people would call my office and start screaming at me. I gave them like a little script to go from, but they could ad lib. Um, so it was this automated system that would give us very negative reinforcement anytime we went on Facebook. Um, and it was a lot of fun to build and play with. Uh, I, I'm, I know this is schadenfreude, but I really am comforted by the fact that someone with a degree in psychology also has the same problem that I <laughs> do, spending too much time on social media. Uh, I think everyone has that problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Rob, thank you so much. You can find out more at robertrmorris.org. Uh, you can follow t Robert on Twitter at Robert R. Morris. Anywhere else where people can find you? Um, if any of your listeners or viewers are interested in helping us test the new app, they can go to www 
www.itscoco.com. Well, thank you, Rob. Hopefully we can talk again once the site is up and running. Yeah, I'd love to. All right, take care. Okay, bye now. Coming up, Netflix releases earnings and 9% of U.S. men say they'll buy an Apple Watch. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Casper. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost. Now, Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing that savings directly to the consumer, you. Casper's mattresses are obsessively engineered and they're at very fair price. They're, they use two technologies, latex and memory foam. They come together for better nights and brighter days. It's a comfortable mattress that has just the right sink and bounce. A Casper mattress provides long lasting comfort and support. Now, I got my new Casper mattress and I tried it out. It is so soft and comfortable, I won't ever go back. Now we're planning on buying two more for my twin boys. They fit right into the Ikea bunk bed frames. But it's not just me. I was looking at my latest edition of Consumer Reports magazine, and they also gave Casper a great review for the price. And you too can buy a Casper mattress easily online. It's completely risk-free. Casper understands the importance of trying out a mattress. So you can try sleeping on a Casper mattress today. Casper offers free delivery, painless returns within a 100-day period so you don't have to lie down in a showroom, which is great because statistically lying on a bed in a showroom has no correlation to whether it's the right bed for you. Get a Casper mattress. It's $500 for a twin, $950 for king size. Compared to industry averages, that is a great price. And you can save an additional $50 as one of our audience members by going to casper.com slash TN2 and entering the promo code TN2. That's casper.com slash TN2 and promo code TN2. On to a few more stories we're following today. Let's say a company slaps you with a patent infringement lawsuit. What's your best defense? One way out of that sticky situation is to simply buy the company. That's what Ninebot did. Now, Ninebot is a Beijing-based personal transportation robot company that makes devices that look suspiciously like the Segway. They also make one without handles, which seems terrifying. Today, Ninebot announced their acquisition of Segway, the personal electric transportation equipment company. That's a Ninebot. Looks like a Segway, right? Uh, during the acquisition of Segway, Ninebot made no mention of the fact that they were named in Segway's recent patent complaint, along with several other Chinese companies. Ninebot purchased Segway with the help of some big wigs you might have heard of, such as the Xiaomi Corporation and Sequoia Capital. Now, having, having recently ridden a Segway, I can personally tell you that it's so much fun you totally forget how ridiculous you look while you're riding it. However, when I told super twit engineer Alex this, he wisely pointed out that wearing sweatpants every day is so comfortable that you sometimes forget how sloppy you look, but that is not a reason to do it. Thank you, Alex. He never looks sloppy. Sloppy or sloppy. <laughs> On to our next story, the New York Times reports that European regulators officially filed their antitrust case against Google this morning. This comes after a five-year investigation into whether Google abused its dominance in web searches to the detriment of competitors. As Mike Elgin reported this morning on Tech News Today, Google faces a maximum penalty of $6 billion. And in a separate investigation, the EU will also look into alleged anti-competitive deals made for Google's Android operating system. To watch Mike's full report, as well as his interview with Washington Post reporter Todd C. Frankel, go to twit.tv. According to an exclusive Reuters poll, about 6% of U.S. adults plan to buy the Apple Watch. Men are twice as likely to buy the watch than women. In case you were wondering how you could extrapolate this poll of 1,829 U.S. adults to real people, based on recent census data, this could mean a sale of approximately 15 million watches in the U.S. alone. And Netflix just announced their first quarter earnings. Earnings per share were up. Subscriber growth exceeded expectation. The company says they added about 14 million new users over the past 14 months. And unless you've been living in a bunker in Indiana like a mole woman, you already know that the company has changed the way we consume entertainment. Shares of Netflix were up at least 12% in after hours trading. And finally, you might have heard that yesterday, comedian Jerry Seinfeld referred to YouTube as a giant garbage can. An article in Business Insider says Seinfeld was speaking to advertisers at an event for Sony's streaming service Crackle, where the comedian's popular web series, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, is about to start its sixth season. According to a transcript from the speech on Tube Filter, Seinfeld was answering a crowd question about the need for user-generated content on Crackle. 
We have a giant garbage can called YouTube for user-generated content, Seinfeld said, to which I say, sometimes you can find really interesting stuff in the garbage can. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Thanks to everyone who gave us feedback about the show on our annual survey. If you have more feedback, comments, questions, ideas for the show, you can email me directly at megan at twit.tv. That's M-E-G-A-N at twit.tv. If you like the show, subscribe to the video or the audio version with iTunes, Feedly, Stitcher, or even the giant garbage can of YouTube. You'll find all your free subscription options at twit.tv slash TN2. You can also write directly to the show at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, hosted by Mr. Mike Elgin, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.